journey through Nehemiah. We've made it to chapter 6 and 7. It really is a climactic moment as we'll see the wall in Jerusalem being completed. But what we'll see is that it's not the end of the story. Uh, there's more to be done because God's people now need to be rebuilt. I called my sermon from this section, Success in Spite of Opposition. As always, I encourage you to just to take some time to read through this section before you carry on with this video. Spend a bit of time praying, asking God to help you to understand this section. And then, as always, I'm going to show you some of what I've seen from God's Word. One very important thing to notice in this section is that the spotlight is very much on Nehemiah. So, to use the character's tool, we see he mentions himself a number of times. Now, I'll explain in a moment why I only marked up to uh, verse 5 in chapter 7. I'll explain what's going on in the rest of chapter 7 in a moment. But it's important to notice this repetition at this stage. And Nehemiah says, I had rebuilt the wall. So the spotlight is very much on him. Up till now, he's been speaking uh, much of the time in the plural, we built or we uh, repaired. But now it's I had rebuilt. Now that doesn't minimize the work that the others are doing. It's just introducing the point of this section. Nehemiah himself is going to come under fire. A useful tool again in looking at a narrative like this is looking at the narrative plot arc and it helps us again in this section. Setting, conflict, point of climax, how it resolves the resolution and the new setting. The setting is given here in chapter 6 verse 1, so just up front here, where we see the old enemy returns with an eye fixed on Nehemiah himself because there's not a gap left in the wall. So their moment to attack is closing very quickly because all they need to do is put the doors and the gates now. And so the setting is given with the old enemy coming after Nehemiah himself. And then the conflict builds in chapter 6 verse 2 all the way through to verse 14. So all the way through to here. The conflict is building and we see a series of attacks on Nehemiah which are described but Nehemiah displays his trust in God and he continues with the work. And throughout this section, as the conflict is building, although they're attacking Nehemiah as the leader, we don't hear about God's people actually taking on board any of those attacks. The, the enemies are trying to discredit Nehemiah, but the people don't take that on at all. And we see that they were very much behind Nehemiah as the leader of this work. The climactic point comes in chapter 6, verse 15 to 16 this section here and the important thing the wall is completed and it's done in 52 days and it's done with the help of our God and the tables turn instead of their enemies attacking the enemies are now afraid because they see how God has helped his people the resolution comes in 6 verse 17 through to 7 verse 4 where the same tactics continue where we see Nehemiah under attack still in, in this section, but Nehemiah continues to lead by putting measures in place to protect the now completed city because we see after the wall had been re rebuilt and the doors are put in place. So now what they were waiting for in verse 1 is now complete, so the whole work is completed. And the new setting is given in uh, 7 verse 5 where the focus shifts from building the wall to building the people within the wall. So we see God had put it in my heart to assemble the nobles, the officials and the common people for registration. And then flowing on chapters 8, we'll see Nehemiah teaching the people from God's word or Ezra the scribe reading and the people being taught. So they being formed into the people they were supposed to be 
within this now completed wall. Now, just a quick note on what's going on. Why, why are we given this whole long list of names from verse 6 all the way through? It's just names after names after names with numbers and then huge amounts that they were given or that they gave towards the work. Uh, if you were to put this in terms of today, in South African terms, a thousand derricks of gold is eight million rands worth of gold in today's term. Um, so that's then 160 million rands worth of gold. So it's huge amounts of money that are given towards the project. But what's going on in this section? Why is it here? And even more interesting, if you go back and look at Ezra chapter 2, this is just a repetition. So if you look in, in Ezra 2, and you read them side by side, it is almost absolutely identical. So why is it here? Well, the importance here, why would they have wanted to see the same list repeated? It's about a hundred years later, or just under a hundred years later than when Ezra 2, those returnees came, and now they repeat that in this new generation. And what's happening is they want to give, show the continuity. The same God who brought this huge community of people home in Ezra's day, he's the same God who is at work in this day. And these people who are all there are going to form this new community settling in Jerusalem, living God's way for God's glory in God's world. And so the focus is very much on the earlier uh, part, so chapter 6, um, up to the early part of chapter 7 and we see Nehemiah is in focus here and the big thing we see is the enemy's return. Uh, back in chapter 5 uh, we saw the enemies stepped into the background as there was trouble within the community itself, there was danger within and Nehemiah stepped in and he told the people that they were called to love each other and they responded well, they stopped charging each other interest, and so that potential danger was moved to the side and into the gap these enemies step. But now they are focusing the attack on Nehemiah himself. So we see these en enemies throughout the section. So that's where just looking at the different characters to put the enemies and Nehemiah, you can see they very much lining up. Uh, the enemies are trying to attack him. And they are attacking him because of what he calls the great project that he's working on. Uh, the work on the wall. This building work that they are finishing off here. And the attack comes in a few different ways. So firstly, they say, come, let's meet together. Uh, they're trying to get Nehemiah away from the work, but he knew that they were scheming to harm him, so he didn't go down to meet with them. Then later on, they send this open letter, and at the end of the letter again, they say, come, let us meet together. What's happening in this open letter, um, so we see this unsealed letter, Sanballat is trying to discredit Nehemiah here. He's saying, oh, we've heard that the Jews are plotting a revolt, that uh, you want to uh, be king that you've got prophets in place who are going to say, there is a king in Judah. And so they say, now this is a big report. Come, let's meet and talk together about this. We see that kind of idea repeated again here. Uh, let's meet in the house of God. So trying to call Nehemiah away from the work that he was meant to be doing. So here they're just trying to get him away from the work. Here Sanballat is trying to discredit Nehemiah and put doubts into the people's heads about what he's really trying to do. Uh, here... This uh, Shemaiah is calling Nehemiah to do something that was against God's law. Come meet in the house of God. Only the priests were allowed to live in the house of God. And for Nehemiah to go into the inner sanctuary of the temple would have been against God's law. It would have discredited him as a leader. So they're very much trying to attack Nehemiah and get Nehemiah to turn away. And they're doing this now because their moment of opportunity is closing quickly. Uh, we saw here that not uh, or the doors weren't set in the gates yet. And, and before that's happened, they still have an opportunity to get in and try and stop the work. But by the time we get to the beginning of chapter one, we see uh, chapter seven, 
we see that the doors have been set in place. And now Jerusalem is able to be closed up. Jerusalem, the, the gates are not to be opened until the sun is hot. Nehemiah says, uh, shut the doors and bar them. So we see now that the city is in a place where it can be secured. Now another tool worth looking out for is the repetition tool of important ideas. And what we see here is, here in verse 9, they were all trying to frighten us. That idea is the same word is used. It's this word here, intimidate. They were trying to intimidate Nehemiah. And we see it again, they're trying to intimidate me. Tobiah is trying to intimidate me. But thankfully throughout this section we see that the intimidation tactics didn't work. They weren't actually able to frighten Nehemiah because Nehemiah trusted God. We've seen this throughout this uh, book that Nehemiah was a man who, who prayed, who remembered, who trusted in God. And here we see him again pray. Now strengthen my hands, God. And then he realizes here that God had not sent uh, this so-called prophet. And so again, in verse 14, he prays to his God, remember my enemies, God. And the key climactic moment, as we saw here, is that this work is completed, but they knew that it had done, been done with the help of our God. How did they know that God had helped them? Well, the work was done in 52 days. It's less than two months that it took them to finish this wall. If you go and visit Jerusalem now and even see this old wall, it's massive blocks and bricks that they used to build this wall. So it was a colossal effort. And the enemies were all wondering, how did they get this job completed so quickly? And here we see that it's the enemies actually who end up being afraid. It's the same word used here. So the tables have turned. It's now the enemies who are afraid, who are intimidated, because they realize that this work had been done with the help of our God. God had been helping his people to finish his work. And that's one of the massive things we see. Despite this opposition aimed at godly leaders, God will strengthen his people to complete his work. And a big takeaway would be that we want to help our leaders to persevere as they lead us in the work God has given us to complete. Just another side note, we see in this uh, section that the men of Israel are mentioned. Now, the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, had been taken into exile uh, by the Assyrians, never to be heard of again. But here, God's people are spoken of as not the Jews, but as Israel. And this is because they want to see Ezekiel 48 fulfilled. So you've got verse 19, and then you can also look at uh, verse 31 to 34, uh, where a prophecy had said that representatives from all Israel would be in the city. Uh, so the people have this in their minds as, as they're building, and here we see all Israel represented. As we reflect on this uh, theologically, the wonderful news is that they did complete the walls of Jerusalem. And what Nehemiah was wanting to do was to see God's name and fame held high in all the world. And he was preparing for another leader who would also face much opposition from enemies. Our Lord Jesus would one day walk into this city only to be led out a few days later to be executed. So this idea or this theme of the enemies uh, attacking God's leader was seen most fully in our Lord Jesus. But we also see that Jesus' work was completed. With the power of God, he was raised from the dead. On the night before Jesus went to the cross, he said to his disciples, you can go and read in John 16 verse 33, he said, I've told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So Jesus did complete the work he came to do. On the cross he overcame. And as we see the community backing their leader, they're getting behind him, they finish the work. Behind Nehemiah as the leader God had established for this work and with the help of God they finished the work. It's worth us thinking about uh, what it looks like for us to support our leaders 
And another great cross-reference would be to go to Hebrews 13 verse 17, where the writer encourages his readers to submit to the authority of their leaders and to do that in a way that would be for their joy rather than a burden to them. And so pray that God would help you to trust the leaders who God has given you to lead the work that he's given you and that you would submit to that authority and for you as you follow that leader that it would be a joy for them to lead you rather than a burden. But also flowing out of this, there should be a reminder to be praying for our leaders because enemies are going to attack. and They'll try and take out the leaders because if they can take out the leaders, they may be able to stop the work. So pray for your leaders. Pray that God would raise up more leaders like Nehemiah who will prayerfully lead and who God will use to complete the work in miraculous time. There are great things lying ahead of us as God's people Much work still to be done, so let's pray that God would help us to do that work for His glory. Well, God bless as you dig in further.